uh, and then becoming, being lucky enough to be selected as an astronaut. I want to run through a few slides from my STS-131 mission, and then I think we have, what, an hour? Is that right? Sure. So it's more fun for me if I take question and answers, because I love to tell stories, and your questions usually uh, bring about a good story from the space station or from my time in space or training or whatever. So uh, I'll whip through a few slides just to... Uh, kind of give you an idea who I am, what I do, where I'm from, that kind of thing. And then we'll open it up for some questions and we can talk about social media if you'd like. You if you'd like. Okay, go. So here we are. That's the crew of STS-131. So from your left to my right, that's Dottie Metcalf Limburger Cheese is what I call her. Her real name's Lindenburger. But uh, being old like I am, I'm a nickname kind of guy, so I call her Limburger and then I just shortened that to Cheese. And then Stephanie Wilson, who I flew with on STS-120, Jim Dutton, an Air Force uh, fighter pilot, and Dex, Alan Dex Poindexter. He is, his father is uh, Admiral Poindexter of uh, United States history fame, and he's a, a heck of a guy. He's now at a Monterey uh, working at the, at the uh, postgraduate school, the Navy postgraduate school. Noko Yamazaki from the Japanese Space Agency, Rick Mastracchio from Waterbury, Connecticut, and then yours truly from uh, Ashland, Nebraska. Go ahead. That's our, oh, if you guys want to have a really cool shirt with the uh, STS-131 logo on it, that's it right there. So just call 1-800-LANDS-AND, and then you can tell them you want the STS-131 logo, and they'll print you a shirt. So go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> uh, these are the loves of my life right here. That's my family. Uh, my daughter Sutton is lower right, and she's a fourth grader at Goforth Elementary. My son Cole is a 14-year-old freshman. He's six foot three and 195 pounds, and he would like to be wearing one of these in several years right here. And then my beautiful wife, Susan, she is also a NASA employee here at the Johnson Space Center. She works in the uh, education, human resources, uh, external outreach kind of area. And uh, she is the love of my life, and she is one of the main reasons that I became an astronaut in the first place. Uh, the fact that I knew her and that uh, people knew of her and her reputation, I think was a big thing to help get me uh, into the office. So um, I'm very proud of my Nebraska heritage. Uh, the autograph on the helmet is, I think his name's Bob Patrick or something like that. So you guys don't get it because you don't know who Bo Pelini is, do you? <laughs> if you follow football, you know who Bo Pelini is. So go ahead. All right, now we're going to play a little game. I show you a picture and you tell me what the caption should be. Okay? Arg. <laughs> Arg is good. That's kind of overused. How you doing is another good one. The chlorine got my eye. Okay, so you got to hit it twice, I think, and then the caption will come up. Yep, I'm peeing in the water. <laughs> and uh, these two guys are, this is one of the trainers that helps us in the emergency training in the MBL, the neutral buoyancy lab, the big swimming pool out at uh, uh, Toward Ellington, and then one of the scuba divers here making sure I don't drown. And it's actually the fact is, on this picture, I was winking at my wife, Susan, who was on the side of the pool deck when we were doing this. So go ahead. All right. Caption? Anyone? Anyone? I'm sorry, what? I'm on a mission from God? I'm on a mission from God. <laughs> Men in black. Men in black, yeah. Actually, we're mostly in blue. Yeah, two old dudes. He's the old dude. I'm young. Holy cow. Lighten up. Okay, so go ahead. Bruce Willis, see your heart out. Hey, there you go. Beautiful. Next. Why does everybody laugh when they see this picture? <laughs> uh, by the way, that's Rick Mastracchio, my EVA partner on SS-131. That's his foot. One step ahead. Yeah, one small step for Rick, one giant push for Clay. But, and I am in the CO2 absorber uh, compartment of the STS uh, Discovery shuttle. So uh, we were there for a test just to walk through the vehicle, and there was nothing in that bay. So we all got to go in there if we wanted to and stick our head through. But, of course, I was the only one that, was, that wanted to. <laughs> Okay, hit the uh, button. Mother told me there would be days like this. Oh, wait, you didn't like that? Okay. Well, you didn't give me one that was better, so how about this one? Anyone? Oh, you've heard my presentation, haven't you? Yeah, she's, okay, you need to be quiet the rest of the way. Cheater. Somebody escort her from the room, please. Go ahead. Oh, there's nothing with this one, so sorry. There's, this is just the uh, Discovery 
if all goes according to plan, this will have been her last night launch. So we launched about 5.40 in the morning uh, the day before Easter. So go ahead, and I think there's a video. Now, when you watch this video that he's going to click on, you're going to hear some giggling and laughter when you see the video insert, and that's the rookies on our space flight. All right? that, this is how you tell that you're flying with rookies. Okay? So that's our patch, <clears throat> and I'll point out that time in a minute. We were launching in, in uh, darkness, so you always get that great, the xenon lights, uh, lighting up the pad. There's Dex. There's Jim Dutton, the pilot. He's a rookie. There's Rick, a veteran of three flights, or two flights up to that time. There's Dottie. There's Clay. I'm pretty relaxed this time. And there's uh, Stephanie Wilson. Yeah, if you got volume, crank it up. I think you got to just... It's thinking. It's thinking. It's high-tech computers. Windows? Hey, I know Bill Gates. Back off. <laughs> yeah, well, you got to take your millionaires and billionaires as you get them. Okay. We're going to start over. Start over. All right. Summer reruns are here. Uh, Dottie Metcalf Limburger Cheese was the big uh, designer of our mission patch. And, of course, we go through it several iterations to get it where we, where we want it. And uh, I think it turned out pretty nicely. Uh, she's a rookie. Noke was a rookie, uh, Dottie was a rookie, and Jim was a rookie, so. And a chicken's a rookie over there. <laughs> you know, you can never have too many rubber chickens at your presentation, so. I think we locked up again. I can't tell if it's in. Yeah, we kind of went past it. That's kind of the end. Houston, we have a problem. All right, that's, we're getting closer. Okay, we've seen this part before. This is uh, deep space right here, this picture. <laughs> well, you can, but most of us have our eyes closed. So, uh, Actually, we're pointing up. Because on launch day, all you care about is up. So we may just have to skip it over. Or I can tap dance. What? There you go. Was not wanting to let me do much right now. Huh. <clears throat> so, does anybody have any questions thus far? <laughs> While they're working on the technology, we can uh, we can answer a question or two if you'd like. Keep this old session moving. Who helps with the uh, the patches? Like all the because I know that uh, all the patches are the symbols. Well, you know, we had a here. We'll go we'll go through it, and I'll get back to that, but. Uh, we have a lot of input on the patch. You basically look at what your mission is, and you try to figure out. Well, big thing here was Dottie had such a big darn name. We had to figure out what shape of patch could hold her name on it. We had to go with a circle because that was the only way you could get all our letters on there. All right, so summer reruns, if this works. We've already seen this part. Hopefully, we'll get past it. Rick's very calm. Dottie, she was pretty excited all day. And then I think I was telling jokes. Okay, there's Noko. We're walking out, and when, it, when Noko walked out, the whole crowd was uh, Japanese media, pretty much. Boy, they were loving, loving her. Uh, she was very famous. She's like, they're like rock stars over there. Um, so we got on to the uh, pad. You're going to see us on the pad as we look up, and somebody's in the orbiter getting the vehicle ready for us to go taking our picture. So that was kind of cool. So here's Dottie in the middle. Rick's over there reading a the magazine. Dex is on this side, and Jim is over here, and Dottie is really pumped. We pull the white room away. Uh, so that we can get ready for launch, and then, of course, the engines fire up. There would actually be really cool sound with this, but we'll just, uh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> so you're not going to hear how you tell who the rookies are, because they're giggling and laughing, and, and Jim, every so often, he'll go, oh, gosh. <laughs> and then Dottie will go, oh, wow, this is so cool. And then Jim will go, oh. And then Dex will say, hey, we're at, you know, 37,000 bazillion miles per hour. And then um, it was really fun. To be with a crew that had three rookies on it. Yeah, yeah, it's bugs. That's all right. We'll keep working. There, crank it up. 100%. There's just no audio coming out of this computer. Okay, that's all right. So we had a great, there's cameras now on the solid rocket motors, ah. which give us a, a picture that we didn't used to be able to get. I heard something. Yeah, poof. I think we blew all the speakers out. Still nothing. 
So here we are when they separate from the solid rocket motors. We got a really good view of the uh, sunrise that was coming up. We were actually racing toward the sunrise. So some gentleman in uh, Florida took this picture. It's about a six and a half minute time lapse. So uh, at the point, at the end of tra the trajectory, it's about six minutes. So go ahead and go to the next slide and we'll, we'll just forego the videos. They're not. They're not playing nice. No. See, I told you they should have let me bring my computer and just do it on mine. <laughs> so to go back to your question, you get lots of different input, and then you have to figure out how to arrange it, and they give us a graphic designer who's the first person to actually come up with ideas and, and draw pictures that match what Dottie gave him as, here's our mission, here's our number, here's the crew, here's what we're going to carry into space, here's what we're going to do. And then we look at various pictures and we decide, well, gosh, it'd really be nice. We didn't have a space station in our patch originally. And so I wanted to have the station in there because that's where I was before and I was going back. And then we took the astronaut symbol. Most patches typically have those three bars with the star at the top that's the symbol of the astronaut core. Uh-oh. Yeah, we're having fun. So anyway, while he's jacking with all that, we can just do question and answers. So somebody, anybody have a question? Comment or cheap shot? Yes. Where'd you learn that diarrhea was a problem in space? <laughs> on the internet? We know everything's true on the internet. Started by Al Gore, I believe. Um, well, what happens is, is when you go to space, yes, you have no gravity, so you, the fluid does go to your head. And that's because there's no gravity to pull it and help distribute it through your body. So your brain has to think about it for a while, about what to do. So a lot of times when you see astronauts in the first day or two in space, they're kind of puffy in the face. Uh, I've never heard that it led to diarrhea. <laughs> it didn't lead to diarrhea with me. I think the food might lead to diarrhea, but not, not the, sh the fluid shift in your body. Are we back online? We seem to be. We seem to be. Okay, so you can go ahead. There's that really cool picture again. From Space View Park. Another version of a similar shot. Go ahead. So there's Mickey Mouse right down here. And he's watching us go. That one made the Florida Today. Go. Uh, there's a heart up at the top. I've had two launches in my life, and both times the plume left the shape of a heart, and the NASA photographers captured that heart. So people that, on my family side and my, my group of fans, they say that's attributed to me. So I'm going to keep it. Go. I took this picture of the station from 40 miles away with an 800-millimeter lens. Not too bad for not having been in space for three years when I grabbed that camera. And that's where we're headed. So you get a really good look at this big dragonfly. It's very cool to see where you're, where you're going. Go ahead. Uh, here's me in the window decks. The commander told me that I needed to get in the window and wave when we did the RPM. We roll around and do 360 spins so that they can take pictures of the shuttle and tiles and things. Well, he didn't say I couldn't bring my Nebraska hat and stick it in the window. So uh, this was a big hit in the Omaha World Herald and Lincoln Journal Star on Rendezvous Day when they got a, a shot of this picture. So go ahead. Uh, there's lunch. <laughs> what? That is peanut butter, right? And this does cause, and this does cause diarrhea. <laughs> this is a fluid shift tortilla right there. <laughs> so here I am coming out of the hatch on, this is uh, spacewalk number two uh, for Rick and I on that. I did three when I went up the first time and got to do three more. Uh, I had already done one with Rick uh, when I was on the space station, so I did, ended up doing four with him, which was really cool. Go ahead. Uh, here's proof positive that I was indeed in space. He had me pop my visor up in a dark pass, and he took my photo. Go ahead. Uh, here I am. You get a great, if you think about it, you get a great idea about how st big the station is because the solar array behind me is on the out outer edge of the station. This is the back end of the payload bay of the orbiter with the camera that's back there. And so in the next shot, when he moves the slide, you're going to get a better idea of how big all this stuff is. So Rick's on the right, Clay's on the left, and that big white box in the middle is an ammonia tank, and it weighs about 1,800 pounds. We unscrewed four bolts, then I grabbed it, and I lifted it up with Rick's help, and then I turned and handed it to the robotic arm, and the arm grabbed it and moved it over toward the station. So here's another shot of us. Uh, Rick is on the left, Clay's on the right. We had to crawl under the station. We had to put in a couple of uh, pieces of hardware that were going to help steady the... Uh, uh, radiators that rotate behind the back side. But this is just a pretty picture because of the uh, atmosphere and the limb of the Earth. Go ahead. 
There was a little advertisement for the University of Nebraska. <laughs> Cornhusker football team. Okay, if this video works, that's Greece out of the cupola. The cupola came, the mission before we got there. So we were very excited that we were going to get to use the cupola. I did not have the cupola, obviously, during my long duration mission in space. That widow, window in the middle is twice to three times as big as any window that I had when I was on board the station. And you can look through the cupola, which is like a bowl. You can look from one horizon to the other horizon. You can cover about a distance of 3,000 miles with your eyeballs. So let's see what it looks like. Can you see? Yeah. Okay. So we're going to sail in, and this is at night. We're coming up on Houston here. There's Houston. Then New Orleans. There's Atlanta. And here comes sunrise. And this is all done with still photography over time period. Oh, it froze again. That's a bummer. See, we shouldn't try videos. It's just, is that a Mac? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> if it, yeah, it'd work if it was. Yeah, okay. All right. All right. So uh, one of the things we did, or I like to do, is I played. And again, with rookies on the crew, it was really fun for me. Having lived in space for five months before, I could do all the fun stuff because I'd been there so long, I'd screwed it all up on my own. But I could teach them the, the right way to do it, right? How to make a bubble in a bubble, how to put an M&M &M inside a bubble, how to do all that cool stuff with, with your food. And it was really fun to watch them learn how to do it. So go ahead. Now that's Ricky Mouse. He was our mascot. We actually took live mice, and Ricky Mouse was a lot cleaner than all the live mice. Go ahead. Uh, if you look way at the top, you'll see Venus, and then, of course, the crescent moon, and then the Earth's limb. So I took that photo. I just like it. Go ahead. Uh, that one's over, uh, I always remember the island, but it's east of uh, the east coast of uh, Brazil. Go ahead. The Aurora. Yeah, that's pretty cool, isn't it? Go again. There's the Milky Way. And the next one's the best picture of the Milky Way. This is like National Geographic stuff, I think. Uh, Dex, the commander, is a professional photographer on the side. He, he says he's an amateur, but he's really a pro. Um, and he took this picture with a four-second exposure on a Nikon D2S. Go. Here's Clay and Rick uh, spending your tax dollars wisely. Oh, shoot, this was a guess, so hit it twice and you'll see that we're spending your tax dollars wisely, see? Go ahead. Uh, there's no caption here. This is just Clay exercising on the bike inside the shuttle. Go. Here are the orb blueberries. <laughs> no Rex and Stephanie in the front row, Jim, Clay, Cheese, and Rick in the back row. Go ahead. Uh, the station as we flew around it on our way home to Earth. Now, this is why we didn't land on the first day. <laughs> Our commander wanted to, right? Mr. Duffy, you can attest. You probably would go for that, right? <laughs> go ahead. Here we come screaming in. And the neat thing for me, the first time I went into space, I rode on the mid-deck. The mid-deck has no windows. I sat in the middle of the floor. I couldn't see anything. I didn't know what was going on. I was about ready to peek my brains out when we hit the ground. But the second time... I got to ride on the flight deck with the rest of the uh, flight deck crew. So I'm at this back window, kind of right behind the window. But the neat thing was, when we came down over the threshold of the runway, where the families are waving, I could actually see my family waving at the orbit. It was very cool. It was very, very cool. Uh, and it was, you know, pretty special for me because I hadn't gotten to do that before. Go ahead. Uh, this is the back end of the bird coming back. And Dex put it down like smooth as silk. Go. I don't know if this one will work, but we can just try, I guess. There it goes, locked up. So skip that one. That's a really good video. Thank you so much. Actually, it's not that good. And uh, here's our last caption contest. Anyone? You'll notice that Dex, is, and Dex and Rick and Mash are paying really close attention to the words that I'm speaking. <laughs> can we go back? I left my luggage in Albuquerque. Yeah, that's a good one. Anyone else? I'd like to thank the Academy. Yeah. There you go. Go ahead. This is kind of a local one. As a future governor of Nebraska, Husker season tickets for everyone. This goes over really big in Nebraska, not, not in Houston so much. Of course, nobody wants uh, Houston ticket, se or season tickets to the Texans or the... Uh, oh, come on. Lighten up. Uh, this is an important picture for me, and it's an important fi picture for Nebraska. I'll explain to you why it is, and y you may get a greater appreciation for this, but... Um, the hat, of course, is pretty obvious. That's the hat I took up. It's a Husker baseball hat that I took up on my first mission. 
so I took it again. But the baseball is significant because that was the baseball to the College World Series this past spring. And it was, it's always held in Omaha, Nebraska, and it was the last time to ever hold it at Rosenblatt Stadium. They're building a new stadium down the road. So I took that baseball, and then I returned it uh, on opening day to the College World Series. The two gloves there, does anybody know the significance of the gloves? Okay. The Olympic bobsled team at the last Winter Olympics won the gold medal from the United States. The pusher on that team was Kurt Tomasevich. And Kurt Tomasevich is from Nebraska. He played football at the university. And he wore those gloves when he pushed the bobsled to the gold medal. Okay, so what else do you recognize in that picture? Anything? There you go. That shirt is Larry the Cable Guy's shirt. <laughs> he came to Houston right before we launched. He came in January. We launched in April. He did a concert. My wife and I got in touch with his agent and asked if he would like a tour of the Johnson Space Center. He came down. He flew in the shuttle mission simulator. We took him to the control center. We took him as many places as he wanted to go. We went to his concert that evening. At the end of his concert, he took us down to meet Jeff Foxworthy and Bill Ingvall and himself and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I said, hey... I'll fly that shirt in space for you. So he took the shirt off. <laughs> he gave it to me, and I washed it 37 times before uh, <laughs> I was able to take it on board. But that is Larry the Cable Guy. He says he's worn that shirt in more uh, performances than any other shirt that he has. I'm not sure I believe him, but smelling it, it's very possible. And the last thing is the pants that we wear in space these days are made by a company called Cabela's. Anybody heard of Cabela's? Yeah. Okay, Cabela's is a Nebraska owned, operated, started company. They have three stores in the United States. One in Omaha, one in Kearney, Nebraska, and one out near Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. So, everything in that picture is Nebraska. Except the station. <laughs> we could have done that too if we'd have had enough time. <laughs> so, go ahead and hit it and you'll get the caption. Is Nebraskans get her done? So go ahead and see what we got left. Oh, there you go, just a little hunky-dory picture. That's landing day. Uh, I was doing a lot better on this landing day than I was uh, three years earlier when I came back after five months. Go ahead. And that's my mom. Aww. Well, thank you. Uh, the story behind my mom is that when I was on board for five months on the station, she, had, she was diagnosed with lung cancer in my second month. And she fought like hell, and she made it to the end, and she passed away three weeks after I landed for my first mission. So I like to keep a picture in there to keep it real for me. So, Okay, with that, now I'm ready for questions, comments, or cheap shots. How many of these blue jumpsuits do I have? Why, you want to buy one? We know it's, it's variable. We get, when we're astronaut candidates, when we first show up, we get two. And then when you fly, and, and I don't know the rules, there are other astronauts that know the rules way better than me, but my commander for STS-117 came out to the MBL when I was doing a, uh, a water run, and we were at the end of the run in the debrief. He brought me a brand new flight suit with the patch sewn on. And this, this is not the one, but then when Dex, Poindexter, when I went on STS-131, he did the same thing. So, you know, if you wear them out, and, and a lot of the guys that fly a lot, the shoulders get really yellow from the UV rays and stuff, and it's kind of a badge of honor to have a, the, the most gross, yellowed, worn out, beat up, but it's soft as a baby's bear behind once you've worn it 50,000 times. Yes? Uh-huh. Right. Well, it's really hard to take pictures like that, even on the station, too. This was on the shuttle we took that, because it's easier to get the shuttle dark. Because you can put stuff up and cover the lights and cover the windows, and, and, and he can make an exposure that's four seconds looking out at the Milky Way. Uh, the station is really hard, because all the windows look at the ground. There are a couple windows that allow you to look to the side, so you can see the horizon very similarly to, to how we did it. But I could never get, we didn't have the cameras that could do it at that time. And we also didn't have the ability to turn the lights down low enough. Yeah, if you shut all the power off to the station, that's really not good to do. <laughs> yes, Wayne? Uh, on the, uh, as many uh, spacewalks as you had to do. There you go. Okay. As many spacewalks as you had to do. Uh, they say the gloves are really hard on the fingers. Uh, can you explain at all about the new suits that are being developed, uh, how much they're going to be uh, different than the ones that you had to use and how much better? Well, unfortunately, I don't know a lot about the new suits they're doing. 
the gloves that, that have been in use since I began as an astronaut candidate and progressed to a, a flown spacewalking astronaut are basically the same. Well, the only thing that's really changed is the outer palm part because we were cutting those gloves. As a matter of fact, on STS-118, on my second spacewalk, Rick's third, he got a hole in his glove. And he got a hole in his glove because he caught something sharp and they made him climb back in the airlock at about five minutes and five hours and 20 minutes. So we had to cut our EVA about an hour, hour and a half short because he had a hole in his glove. Well, that led to a redesign of the palm part of the glove to make it thicker and stronger so that you wouldn't cut it. Because if you cut through enough layers, right, you're going to get to the part that goes pssss, and that's not, that's not good to get there. So I don't know. That when you put on a glove, you're at about four pounds of pressure. So imagine yourself squeezing on an EVA for six and a half hours and operating everything with your hands and fingers and squeezing against that four pounds of pressure every time you move your hand. It can get, it can get tough. And I've got one fingernail bed that's kind of dorked up because of that. Some guys, they really chew their hands up. Yes? Could I tell me about my mission and the stuff I do? Well, when I spent five months on board, I was an EVA guy. I flew the robotic arm. I was the science officer. I was the medical officer. I was the only USA guy on there with two Russians, so I did everything in the U.S. segment. When I went on STS-131, I had less responsibility specifically except doing three spacewalks. Uh, I flew on the flight deck coming home, which meant I had things to do there. But what Dex, the commander, did was he used me and my experience as a jack-of-all-trades. I could help everyone. You know, when, with three rookies on board, you don't know how they're going to do. So he had me unsuit everybody on the first day in orbit. He had me suit everybody up. He had me help tear down the chairs. You know, I got to do all the stuff that was kind of a big-picture thing. Because he had Dottie and Jim and Noko doing all the specialized training for payloads and that kind of stuff. So I was kind of a jack-of-all-trades. And it was a lot of fun. Yes, sir. Is there any single thing? Is there any single thing you'd want to share with us that you'd want us to take away from this presentation and your experience? Is there is it is there any single thing that you can boil it down to at all? Sure, and I'll do that by talking about social media for a minute. One of the most important things that a person like me can do is to excite people like you about what the United States States space program is all about. Now, you guys are, if I can say it, are probably an easy audience, right? You love space, most of you. So many of you work in the space program, so you have an inherent interest in what's going on. But with the advent of social media, we are able, I am able, for example, to tweet my pick of the day. Raise your hand if you follow Clay on Twitter and watch his pick of the day. So I took 30,000 plus photos in space in five months in the station. Every day I try to tweet and put one of those pics out for people. Now, I asked those people to tell me where it is. In one three minute period of time at my desk, or at my house, I can engage over 12,000 people about the United States space program. And I think that's a big deal. Now, you take a guy like Mas Mike Massimino, who's a fellow astronaut from New York, he's got millions of followers. Naoko Yamazaki, the whole country of Japan probably tweet follows her. Not to mention Suichi Noguchi, a fellow Japanese astronaut. So that's the, the kicker on social media, is it puts people like you in touch with people like me. It allows me to say, in a few words, send you an email, if you will, about my day in space. Now, unfortunately, when I was up there, uh, the first time we didn't have the ability to tweet because we didn't have the internet. Now they have the ability to surf the internet so they can do all this stuff, which is very cool. Uh, I'm kind of doing it after the fact, but I really like it. The other thing that my tweets need to understand is that when you tell me where these photos are, you are helping NASA out. NASA has, imagine, 30,000 photos just from my five months. We're into the 28th or 25th or 26th expedition. And a lot of these people are taking a potload of photos. So every time you guys identify a spot on the Earth on my photos, I give that information to the crew Earth observation people. They don't have enough people to catalog all those photos. So you're cataloging NASA photos for them. That's a big deal. And I think that's huge. And if it excites you and you go, you go get somebody else to follow me, you know, I want the parade to get really big. Heck, I'd like a million followers. 
but I'm from Nebraska, so 12,000, let's see, that's... I think that's South Dakota, Iowa, Kansas, and Nebraska is 12,000. <laughs> and most of them are related to me. What? Oh, good. Well, ratio it. I need to tweet that ratio thing. And, you know, I need to do a statistical analysis. But, but, you know, so if I go back to his original question, what I want people to know from my mission is what I do there is important for you, right? Everything we do to send astronauts into space has a payback to the people on Earth. When Apollo did its thing and spent all that tax dollars and did all those cool things, the payback, I hear different numbers, but I like to use the number, was about seven to one. Seven dollars payback for every dollar invested. But the problem is it takes a long time to realize that investment. And Americans are really impatient these days. Oh, damn, my phone doesn't work. Psst, buy a new phone. Oh, Blu-ray. Got a new Blu-ray player. Throw away the DVD player. Throw away the VCR player, which I still have two VCR players, by the way. But you see what I mean? You have to be patient, and, and we're not good at NASA because we're government, we're not really allowed to advertise. So the things that we do, we have to do in the proper fashion, right? We can't tell you that the tires on the shuttle are made by Michelin. We can't tell you that we're eating Hunt's chocolate pudding on board the station. We can't even call them M&Ms for criminy. We have to call them candy-coated chocolate, <laughs> right? But they're M&Ms. Every one of you guys eats space food, right? So that's kind of a long-winded answer, but that's how the social media thing is so important these days. But it's easy to get in trouble in social media, right? You got to be careful. I probably already <laughs> cut the back end of my bridge off several times. Yes, ma'am. where he's taking a picture and people tweet back what they think it is and if they guess right then when he lands they're going to get that picture autographed by him by the way where do you think he got that idea I'm, I'm think, I, he's not the only astronaut that does picture that. of the day right and, and but yeah but see that's the problem is you know we're a government agency we got to learn we have to learn to be better right we but we can't be like Fox News or CNN or or uh, I don't know Turner News Network or whatever the heck is out there. We can't be that way because we're not allowed. And so I want everybody to know that. You know, if you know, if you can, you find these cool sites, these cool tweets, you need to ship them out to all the people you know. You need to let them know that Scott Kelly, if you find out where his picture is, you get an autographed picture when he comes back to Earth. You need to find out if uh, Leland Melvin, the, the former astronaut who's the education lead now for NASA, is speaking at Podunk high school. You need, you know, if people are in podunk that you know, you need to let them know they're, that he's there. Right? But that, you can do that a lot more effectively than we can. Right? Because we're very limited with our base of people that pay attention to what we do. We want to make it bigger, of course. Yes, ma'am. So, you a couple times that you're not going to fly again. What are you going to do? Are you going to leave NASA, or are you going to stick around and try and inspire us more uh -oh. and try and keep us coming? Well, first yes, of all, I don't like question. to be saying I'm grounded. I just probably won't be flying again. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> See, what, you remember when I said I cut my back end off? Yeah. Uh, what am I going to be doing now? I have three years to, till I can retire from the federal government, so I don't really know. I'm still in the astronaut office. I'm still uh, doing projects for them, trying to help the station guys solve problems that they have that they come up with. You know, we, they bring the problem down to the ground, and we work and we try to develop new procedures or new tools or new pieces of hardware and figure out how we can help them succeed. And that's what I did before I got to fly. It's just a heck of a lot more fun to fly. <laughs> so I'm basically driving a desk right now for, for, the, next, for the foreseeable future until something else comes along. Um, you know, we'll just have to see. But I love doing this part. If I could run public affairs, <laughs> I would love to run public affairs. I, I just like being out with people. That's what I think I'm good at. Yes? Well, you know, following up on uh, the, just that 
previous question, uh, maybe in a larger sense, what are the astronauts going to do? I mean, if there's no shuttle and uh, Orion seems to be in jeopardy, uh, what's the plan for the next five or ten years? Well, you have to ask somebody that makes more money than me, but here's what I'll tell you. There's a line of astronauts training to fly and live on board the space station. Right? They're gainfully employed just like I was. And they're looking forward to it. They're working their butts off. And they want to get into space and they want to enjoy the opportunity to, to live on the space station. Now, the shuttle guys, I don't know. Some of them are, are getting in line for station training. Not all, but some. Uh, some of the astronauts that I came on board with in 1998, 1996 was a class ahead of me. Some of those guys are starting to move out and do other things at other places. For example, Dex. Uh, Alan Poindexter found an opportunity at the Naval Postgraduate School that, that was really good for he and his family. And so he made that move because he chose not to fly on the station. So a lot of astronauts are, are asking themselves now that question, do I want to fly on station? Am I capable of flying on station because you have to meet medical requirements for long duration that are different than those astronauts that fly short duration? So many of them are going through the medical tests to find out if they're even qualified to do it. If they are, they'll begin to take Russian language and, and all the things that are associated with that. And those things are not doable by all, right? I mean, to speak Russian is a formidable task. And some people have it and some people don't. So we'll just see. You, you have to ask each one individually to get the real answer. Yes, sir. This question may be a little bit selfish, but uh, it has something to do with the cupola. Uh, many years ago, I was involved in the development of the Space Vision System. Mm -hmm. SVS, the Are black and white dot. Yep. Uh -huh. uh, and, and I did see it also used inside the cupola. I see the array of the array of uh, monitors were moved into the cupola. I think at one point. Yeah, there, there is a set of robotic workstation monitors in the cupola, yes. Well, oh, is there a permanently now that's moved? Well, they're, yeah, semi permanent. Or, or they can move it into there? Yeah, they're portable, but they're in there for the near future. Okay. okay. I was just wondering what had happened to that system. It was still in use. Well, it wouldn't be really needed anymore because there's no more assembly. Uh, well, and so, even, but, even, no offense, sir, thanks for your hard work, but it, it, in the time I've been an astronaut, it's never been really used. It, okay. And I don't know. There are others that will be able to tell you exactly why, but I don't know the answer. And I imagine with a cupola, there would be maybe would have been less use for it if they had the cupola had been up there earlier. Well, yeah, the cupola gives you such great views, but see, now they're talking about taking the cupola from where it is and moving it, and that, oh. we don't want them to do that because we really like where it's located now. And the crew office says it's got to be Nader facing the Earth, and we really like it on the bottom of Node 3, but if somebody says we have to move it, Node 1 on the bottom would be okay. It's not as good as Node 3, but, but we really like it on the bottom where you can see. And you can see a good portion of the space station from there, or you probably get a better view of the No, space you can also. see a lot. And when the orbiter's docked, I mean, it's the most fantastic view of the orbiter hanging there that you've ever seen in your life. I mean, it, it's amazing. I, you can't describe it. The pictures don't do it justice, but it is fantastic. Yes, sir. What, what yeah, it? it was called the EAS, the Early Ammonia Servicer, which was a 15, 1,600 pound tank of ammonia that was never used, but was deemed disposable after we brought up those big white ammonia tanks you saw in the back end of the shuttle. So now those tanks have the ammonia. We didn't need the EAS, so I got to get on the front of the arm, and Oleg Kotov was the first Russian in the history of the world of space to fly the Canadian robotic arm all by himself. He flew me upside down and out in front of the station. After the station, it totally turned around 180 degrees to fly backwards. So now I'm upside down on the end of the arm, flying backwards, can't see anything except the horizon of the Earth and deep space. And they tell me, you got to throw this away. It's 1,600 pounds. You have to throw it away with at least a velocity of X. Don't screw it up. <laughs> so we practiced for months on a air hockey table in Building 9 at the Johnson Space Center where I'd lay on my side in an EVA suit and let me tell you, it was not comfortable. But I had to grab this thing and I had to throw it away over and over again and practice the technique. And we had this, we had this long, drawn-out, complex technique where I had to rock back and then I had to tell NASA, okay, I'm rocking forward, rocking forward, rocking forward. Pass vertical, patience, 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 patience. Jettison! And, we had to, and I practiced it over and over and over again. And well, it turns out it wasn't the right technique. <laughs> All we really had to do is say, hey, Clay, throw it toward the horizon, right? I'm upside down. The Earth's out there. That's a pretty big target. 
and we want it to go toward the earth because <laughs> it'll burn up in the atmosphere. So all that preparation, and if they just said, hey, throw it toward the earth, dude. <laughs> throw it as hard as you can. <laughs> it probably would have worked out better, but it was okay. I had enough velocity in the right direction to get it to deorbit. It deorbited about uh, 11 months later uh, over Tasmania. What was that feeling like of being able to... Well, it was interesting because I threw two things away that day. I threw a, uh, an item that was called, it's, it's just a big, a big piece of metal that held stuff. And it was about the size of a refrigerator freezer that was empty. So it wasn't as heavy. It wasn't nearly as heavy. I threw that sucker away at about 125 feet per second. That sucker was humming. And it was so cool, you know, to throw that thing away. And I just watched it. It was really neat. Well, then I get this big 1,600-pound tank. <laughs> it wasn't quite the same. You know, and it was like, oh, I'm, I think I'm leaning back. I really can't tell, but I'm trying. <laughs> and then I rock and forward, you know. Here we go, here we go. Oh, vertical, patience, patience, patience. And then, J -J And then it kind of creeps away from you, you know, and you're going, oh my God, I hope I threw it hard enough. But it, it was moving pretty good too, and I got that sucker at 40 feet per second. So, yeah, I was pretty pleased. It was, that was a big day for me. That was pretty cool. Because we came over, I'm holding that thing, and Oleg's flying me to the release point. Well, I don't have anything to do except hold on and look. And so we come over to the northwest corner of the United States, and it's a perfectly clear day in Seattle. We see Seattle and Tacoma. I'm looking down, I'm looking at the Rocky Mountains. I turn my head and my helmet, and way down there, I can see the Great Salt Lake. I'm over Montana, and I can see the Great Salt Lake. I mean, it just doesn't get any cooler than that. Then we flew over to Nebraska, and we we're going to jettison it over Nebraska, which would have been really, really cool, but we lost uh, a video, and we wanted to make sure we had video, and we threw it away. So I think I threw it away somewhere over the Middle East. You got about 12 minutes. Yes, sir. All right. So, you, so you're the astronaut in the room. We're all sitting here completely in awe. This, this guy is wow. Been thank in space. you. Raise your standards. What? He, he's he's. <laughs> well, I'm getting to that. I'm actually that that was the uh, that was the punchline, right? Like I'm getting to that. So, we're in awe. We're completely in awe. What would put you in awe of us? What What do we need to do? What do you want to see us do? We know that's a good question. The, the commer Let me talk about this commercial idea for a second, right? I get that question a lot when I go out on speaking engagements about what do I think about stopping the shuttle and, and all that. Well, about stopping the shuttle, I don't like it, okay? Each shuttle was designed for 100 pops, 100 missions. Most of them are at the average of about 32 to 35-ish, right? You got a lot of missions left. But think about the money that you spend to fly the shuttle, the money that you're spending to fly the station, and then the money that you're going to spend to develop whatever that new program was, Constellation, or will be. That's a lot of taxpayer dough. And in today's economy, in today's environment, even before all this stuff happened with uh, the uh, recession and stuff, that's a lot of dough. Right? So I'm not opposed at all to commercial like guys figuring out how to do this. Right? I, you can go to New York and hop in a taxi every day and they'll take you wherever you want to go from your hotel to wherever you want to go, and they'll bring you back. Well, why couldn't we have taxis that take crews from Earth to the station and back? And if commercial guys do that safely, efficiently, cost-effectively, who am I to say that's not right? My problem with the whole deal is just timing, right? You know, the way we've stacked all this stuff up and the money that's involved, I would have liked to have seen the shuttle keep going if we could afford it, right, until the United States came up with whatever it is, whether it's commercial, whether it's government, whatever it is, to, to cover the gap. You know, I didn't like the gap part. I don't like the part that we have to f pay 51, it's soon to go to $56 million to the Russians to fly a single United States astronaut to the station. However, that's all there is. Pragmatically, that's all there is. So that's what we're going to do. But if, you know, I'm not, I don't make the kind of money and I'm not in position to make those decisions. So I would like to have seen that gap closed or eliminated, and now I'm just not sure whether the gap will be the same or longer or shorter. That's up to the commercial guys to help figure out. Uh, now, in the future, do, we wanna, do I want to go to Mars or the moon or an asteroid? Personally, this is Clay talking, this is not NASA talking. I'd still like to go back to the moon and build a lunar base and figure out how we go to Mars from there. I don't think we can go to Mars now. We don't have the propulsion capability. We don't, ha we don't know how to get there fast enough. And that's a long haul. 
And if I'm going to Mars and take six to nine months to get there, I want my spaceship to be at least three space station modules big. That's what I want. <laughs> Nobody's going to ask me, but that's what I want. I want a place to sleep and play and exercise. I want a place to do something useful like science or whatever it is. And then I want another module, if I can get it, just so I don't go stark raving nuts. Because, you know, the station was a great place for five months. It was easy. It's so big, it was easy. So you don't need the whole thing, but it would be really nice to have two to three modules, in my opinion. But who knows what it's going to be. If it's going to be an Orion capsule, oh, baby, I don't want to do that. <laughs> there are better men than me for that one. But who knows? So what do I need from you? I need Americans to support the space program. I need you to be excited about what we do. I need you to tell the people that don't understand what we do why it's important what we do. Every time they pull their cell phone out to take a tweet, tell them, holy cow, that came from Apollo. Whenever they reach in their garage about that cordless drill and start going pss, 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 to repair their fence after a hurricane, you go, hey, that came from Apollo. Right? Hey, did you know the shuttle tires were made by Michelin? Hey, did you know that they eat M&Ms in the space every day? I need you guys to know that stuff. I need you guys, you guys to be proud of that stuff. I need you guys to go tell those people that don't get it to get it. Because there are a lot of people that don't get it. And part of it, and, and a lot of times, it's simply because they're not exposed to it. I can go to Nebraska today, and I can go to a huge museum, and I'll have a kid come up. Have you been to the moon? Uh, no. And then his mom will come up. Have you been to the moon? And then his dad will come up. Hey! You been to the moon? <laughs> Come on, people. But they're just not exposed to it. That's why it's so important that I am Nebraska's astronaut, that I go back to Nebraska and I tell them what we do. I tell them why it's important. And I want every person that listens to me at Museum X to go home and tell their school and their family and their teachers. And then I want those guys to tell the next school and I want those guys to tell the next one until I can get out to western Nebraska and southwestern and northern Nebraska and tell everybody and go to Iowa and do the same thing. But you know, as astronauts, we don't get that opportunity very often. We're limited as to how much we can go away. Some astronauts don't believe in it. They don't like it. So there you go. Another long-winded answer, but I hope, I hope that tells you what you're looking for. Yes, sir? Is the chick asleep? Yes. Okay. Uh. <laughs> oh, this is my last question with the chicken. So, you have traveled to space twice. What was the scariest moment, the one that made you almost really pee? When I saw Oleg naked was the scariest <laughs> time. No, don't, don't tweet. No, Oleg's a great um, You know, I was never scared, ever. Not, not once for one second was I ever scared. You know, some astronauts, they train to scare out of you. And to a certain extent, they do. When I laid on the pad getting ready for first launch, I had anxiety. I had anxiety because I was going to be away from my wife and my son and my daughter for five to six to seven months at the time. I didn't really. That's anxiety. It's not fear. It's fear of the unknown, which I don't classify as fear. I classify as anxiety. When we came home, no worries. I didn't think about Challenger going up. I didn't think about Columbia going home. I didn't think about anything that we were going to be safe. I was going to see my family. I was going to do my job between launch and entry. Now, I will tell you, in all honesty, on my second trip, that about two days before launch, I thought about death a lot more. Right? I'd lost my mom through the death I came on the first time. Right? My father-in-law is dealing with strokes, so he's not, he's hanging in there, but he's having trouble. And then I looked at my kids, and I got to thinking, holy cow, should I have said, yes, I'm going to go again? Because I had had a successful five months. I had everything go right. And I came home safely. And I touched my wife's hand. I hugged my wife and my kid. And I touched my mom's hand again for that last time. So I thought about that a lot. No fear, just death. And I know that sounds morbid, but you know, you're sitting there staring at something. Was I too greedy? Right? You know, I'd love to fuck four or five times. But it's not just Clay making that decision. It has to be, in my mind, it has to be Clay and Susan and Cole and Sut. That's who I am. And that's how I was raised. And that's what I believe. With that, keep 
follow me on today if you do that thing if you don't consider at astro underscore clay or whoever you want to follow uh have a great time while you do your thing here uh you're gonna hear really cool stuff about uh, the commercialization of space and it's been a pleasure to be here thank you so much <laughs>